Shabtai Sfi is uh, the Jewish Messiah, and I just read, uh, you know, half of this massive tome, uh, and I understand you have a connection with with this gentleman in, in some way, and I'm curious about that, and I'm also curious about this this kind of messianic principle and how it operates and how it works in the world. So maybe I, I, could, I can start there by asking you about, about that, Mark, because I think I think there's something about your mission that has something to do with 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 that. Beautiful. Chris Andrew, it's, it's great to see you. So I'm, I'm glad to see you and I'm delighted to be in this conversation. And I, I just want to share maybe just a word about conversation because it just occurs to me and then and then we'll dive into Shabtai Tzvi, which is you know, I'm I'm intuiting that this is going to be at least a two part conversation because it's a it's a huge, voluminous, and, and unimaginably important conversation. But just to say a word about conversation, you know, I was um, doing a deep dive with someone this afternoon, and you know, they had just had a a bad conversation with someone. And they were devastated. They had a bad conversation. So I said to this person, well, if you had bad food, would you be devastated? Well, it's not so good, but it's not terrible. Right? If it's bad weather, are you devastated? I mean, you had bad sex even, right? You know, I said, well, okay, it's not so good, right? But, you know, okay, we can, we can manage. But a bad conversation, like a really bad, just devastates you. And, and the reason is because the structure of reality is conversation. Reality is a series of conversations. Mm -hmm. And the word Messiah, Mashiach, literally means conversation. That's what the word means. The word Messiah quite literally means Mashiach, Siach, the conversation. And one of the great masters, Nachum of Chernobyl, was an associate of the Baal Shem Tov in the Book of Numbers, actually makes this point in his stupor commentary to the Book of Numbers on Messiah. He says, oh, Messiah is Mashiach, Siach, which means conversation. And so just to honor this conversation, and it's having a great conversation is not casual. It's an erotic act, right? It's an act of mm -hmm. eros. It's a divine act. So it's not like, oh, we're, we're listening in to a conversation, but actually our capacity to enact a great conversation that is, that is real and that, that is honest and attempts to, to find its way to the inside of the inside and to, to step into the the field and the field of value, right, is what we're born to do. It's not a casual act. It's not like we did all the important stuff during the day. Let's let's have a conversation now. Conversation is central to everything. So I just want to just locate what we're doing in that field. So I just want to start there and just pass and, it back to you, and then we'll hand, hand, go into shop tie. Well, I'm wondering about the word also conversion. Is, is this something happens between people when they they talk and that they are, you know, they they can there's a conversion process that happens. In other words, yeah. so, some thing is converted and transformed and there's a third element that arises in the conversation. That's right. And it's, there, there's an eros that's at play and there's at least a conversation is potentiated with the possibility of transformation. And conversion only means transformation, mm. right? And, and evolution is actually a series of transformations. That's a good definition of evolution. Cosmorotic humanism, we have a bunch of equations that we've not really talked about, we've alluded to that I formulated with my, my my dear beloved Zach Stein. And one of them is evolution equals a series of transformations. And the cosmos, right, the erotic universe, or what we call the cosmo erotic universe, is a conversational cosmos. That's a that's that's actually not casual, that's a precise definition. And actually, our dear friend who's a fellow at the think tank, Howard Bloom, wrote a formal mathematical paper on the conversational cosmos all the way down and all the way up. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so I just want to locate this conversation. We are the evolution of conversation. And when we actually learn to have a conversation, that's actually what blows reality open. So I'm just, just, just framing our context. So shop tight fee. Here we go. Shop tight fee. Okay. So this, this is, this is, <laughs> we're in wild territory here, Andrew. And I'm not sure why I agreed to talk about this, but let's, let's, it's it's unimaginably important, and I wrote a um a memoir which I didn't publish um a couple of years ago. Um, it's one of the practices I've shared in our 
you know, circle of study, which is the practice of what we call sacred autobiography. Mm -hmm. But you actually, you write your sacred autobiography, you write your letter in the cosmic scroll. So, you know, you don't want to give students a practice you haven't done, a bad idea in general, right? So I locked myself in a room for about six weeks back in 2000 and I don't know, 12, 13 or something like that. And, you know, about six weeks and I wrote, you know, a couple hundred thousand words, just wrote, you know, a, a, a sacred autobiography. And in that sacred autobiography, what just poured out was all of the depth, which I hadn't articulated to myself even, right, of this relationship with Shabtai. And all the places he's played in my life. You know, when I was leaving Israel in 2006, in a kind of difficult moment, the um, a, a writer in Israel's kind of New York Times, his name was, I think, Yair Shelig, writes that um, Gaffney's leaving Israel and, you know, the community that he established, right, and Gaffney, right, are really Sabatians, mm. right? They're really, they're, they're Sabatians. And I, I read this on the plane, and I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? I'm not a Sabatian. <laughs> what a ridiculous, <laughs> like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And of course, I was right. I'm not a Sabatian, right, obviously. But I, I realized in the fullness of time that he intuited something, right, that was not completely wrong. So then I, I get to the United States and, you know, it, just one little snippet of a story. It's a year later and a dear, dear friend who I barely know, and Ken Wilber had introduced me to her and she was a great feminist theorist, second wave feminist. She just passed away. Sally Kempton was also a great, you know, teacher of Kashmir Shaivism. And, you know, she was kind of Muktananda's key kind of scribe student and wrote most of his books and just a wonderful woman. She actually stepped in and kind of was able to help convene a kind of appropriate fact finding and cleared, you know, the dust away, you know, from some kind of inappropriate claims. But along the way, if I can see if I can find this, she introduces me to an a gentleman whose name I won't say now, but it was a very, very serious man who was the inheritor of the Inca prophecy. True story. Okay. <laughs> so it's like 2007. I'm exiled from my home, right? You know, Sally and a bunch of people are finally, we're finally recovering the information and we're clearing these kind of false claims that have been made, but I'm, I'm devastated. And this Inca shaman says to me, I've had a dream that some master has fallen and now I realize it was you and I need to, and he was very expensive to work with. He said, I don't need anything from you. I just want you to work with me. And I want you to come to Prague with me. This is true. This is all true, Andrew. <laughs> right? I want you to come to Prague with me and we're going to battle the mystical forces in Prague because there are mystical forces in Prague that need battling and we need to engage in some shamanic way this battle and i'm not going to tell the story but but i i went to prague to engage this mystical battle right it's a a story and then we went to poland right um to kind of try and free souls that were kind of stuck in the ground and and i thought you know it's 2007 i thought you know what i'm going to do i'm never going to go back and teach publicly again i was in too much pain but i'm going to spend my life as a kind of wandering Hasidic shaman freeing souls, you know, from graveyards. I thought that was seemed like a good way to spend to spend a lifetime, right? And then he says to me, I just listened to this. He says, and I and we start talking, and this conversation develops. He says, and and you're the reincarnation of Shabtai Tzvi. And I'm like, really, what the fuck? Why is an Inca shaman, but in, in fucking Prague and Poland, telling me, right, that I'm the reincarnation of Shabtai Tzvi? And it's like, you know, so this conversation and it continues. Then he goes to Shabtai's grave, right, to bring me back an energetic blessing. And, and the story goes on and on, right? I won't, I won't, I'll hold the story now, but I'll just give you just one more thing, just just to just to establish just, you know, this is a little thing that I don't really share with people. But if you open up a return to Eros, right? This is a, the book I wrote with uh with Christina, Christina Kincaid, right? So it it opens and it says, you know, I come to speak dangerous words. I ask only that you listen dangerously, Chung Sa. And then, of course, there's Bob Dylan, you know, but to live outside the law, you've got to be honest, right? But then, uh, you know, on the next page, right, the key page is, and I'll just show it here, 
if you can see it. Yeah. It says to Shabtai and Sarah. So the book is dedicated to Shabtai and to Sarah. And Sarah, who's Sarah? Sarah's almost unknown. She's an unknown figure. Sholem kind of ignores her. And, and later, yeah, I was going to ask you about that because in the yeah. book, almost he almost it's almost hard to know who uh, Shabtai's fee is and and who Sarah is. It's because it, he almost it's almost hard to know who they are. They're almost completely mysterious characters. Even though I've read four hundred pages of this thing, I still don't know who they are. Are they right? So Sarah. So so let's let's locate for people Shabtai and Sarah. Let's just. Let's just kind of locate, you know, let's locate people like what are what what are Andrew and Mark talking about about here? So yeah, let's yeah. Get people in, in this conversation. So Shabtai Shab Tzvi is a major mystical figure who who is and and Shalom, you know, analyzes them in a particular way, but I just want to understand with everybody, this mystical figure is not a casual, like he's understood as person who was a brilliant, you know, kind of populist, you know, who wept the masses because he was wildly charismatic and he, he broke sexual boundaries. And a part of his practice was breaking sexual boundaries. That was an essential part of his practice. Shalom writes an essay in his book, The Messianic Idea, which is called Redemption Through Sin, which yeah. is about Shabtai Tzvi. So Shabtai Tzvi is about the redemption through sin, this, this descent Right. The word that Shabtai uses is Yirida Sorechalia, descent for the, the ascent. So Shabtai is this, this breaker of boundaries, right? This breaker of sexual boundaries, right? Who has this charismatic evangelical vision of the messianic age, right? Meaning end of exile, the beginning of a of, of the emergence of a new human, of a new possibility for humanity. And this populist messiah the way the story is told, right, is then, you know, gains enormous, you know, following among the Jewish people. The Sultan of Turkey is threatened and says, convert or die, apostate or death, right? Daptai says, huh, death doesn't sound good. I think I'll convert. He's given these wonderful, um, wonderful um, abode, you know, in, in, you know, in, in the, the, the Sultan's empire and lives out his life, right, as a Muslim. That is understood. Remember, we're talking about the, the 16th century, so that's understood as being not, you know, 21st century religion. Your religion is your identity, is your family, is your brother, your sister, right? When you commit apostasy, you have killed your brother, sister, and mother. It's the ultimate betrayal, basically. The ultimate, the ultimate betrayal. He's yeah. viewed as the ultimate betrayer. And, and then his name becomes this dark and demonized name, right, in Jewish history as the ultimate fiend, right, the ultimate, you know, Charlotte. The fake messiah, the, the, right? All right, the ultimate false Because messiah. I think, as far as I understand, there's an Public enormous amount of Jews at one point in history who actually believed that he was the next, he was the, the messiah who was going to build the, the next temple of Jerusalem, etc. You're right, right, brother. This story gets interesting. So that when I just said, that's the public story. But yeah. here's actually what happened. And this is what Shalom begins to realize. Shalom begins to realize, you know, he's he's studying him in the 20s and the 30s, right, in Israel, in Jerusalem, before Israel's even declared a state. Shalom begins to look at the text. And of course, people realize before Shalom, but Shalom was the first person who, who did this magisterial, you know, entry into the, the manuscripts and the text. And Shalom realizes it's not that the masses were just following him. But actually, the most profound minds, right, of the day, the most sophisticated, right, unimaginable, towering, right, personas of enlightenment and intellect and what I would call eros, right, the great masters of their day who, who would make any of the geniuses of today, right, appear like kindergartners, right, he swept them. In other words, he wasn't just sweeping the masses. He actually swept this enormous array of some, some of the greatest giant intellect, mind, hearts, greatest, you know, Rishi, seer, you know, masters that ever lived are mm -hmm. actually taken by him and actually, as you say, are utterly convinced that he is the Messiah, son of David. So in other words, something was happening here. 
and he had a prophet. They called him the prophet, which was Nathan of Azza, Nathan Azati, Nathan from Azza, was an unimaginably subtle, sophisticated, gorgeous thinker. And, and this great and wild, right, sweep the Choptai is doing amongst the greatest masters of the age are with their knowledge of his breaking of sexual boundaries. So we have to understand he's operating within the classical Orthodox community, because there is no other community right in which the law is everything and he is sweeping major kabbalistic masters Rabbi jonathan ipschitz for example one of the, the most unimaginable masters of his day completely swept up by shop see but the list is long so what's happening here and 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 now just go with me just one more step so shalom is fascinated by shop and then shalom basically takes all of Jewish Kabbalistic scholarship, this huge enterprise, which is central to the cultural enterprise of the state of Israel. You know, the leading Kabbalah scholar in America is, a, I won't say his name, because we're going to hold mystery and privacy there, but he's a, a close friend who was just in my house for several days, right? Um, one of the people, I think, Kathy, who's here on uh, the, the, the broadcast was, was up there with me and James, and we were talking about this, and he, of course, you know, we don't so he doesn't associate with me publicly, but he comes to visit me and study. Right? So that's a different conversation, right? And bless him, and he's a good man, right? And, but but literally the entire enterprise of Kabbalah scholarship in the last 60, 70 years, post Sholem's book, is obsessed with Shabtai Tzvi. In other words, there's more scholarship. Right? And, and fascination, the word fascination is a great word, right? Fascination is a form of love. It means I'm compelled, I'm allured, right? I'm engaged with Shabtai Tzvi. So Shabtai Tzvi becomes this radically central character at the heart of what I would say is the cultural enterprise of Kabbalah scholarship, even as he sweeps the major masters, and yet he's demonized kind of in the standard narrative. So that's just kind of who we're talking about. I just want to get a sense of who we're talking about. Yeah. So. Let Would me... you say he was a figure like, you know, in the East, there's lots of people like kind of crazy wisdom people who are extremely powerful and they they often don't even teach or don't even talk or you know, there's something about it's often I think Nathan was his voice piece, right? Nathan of Gaza. And he right. doesn't seem to actually speak or talk or do much. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, he seems to be just a, an, a, 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 an amazing presence of some kind. And I know there's people like the Karmapa or something in Tibet or, that, that, are, that are similar to that. No, I, I get you. And he's not an Eastern crazy wisdom master. Right? He's not a I mean, you know, this is a bad example. But, you know, my friend Richard Alpert, we spent you know quite a bit of time talking at some point on uh, his, his pop popular name, Ram Das, And he would. Tell me, um, and my other friend, I have another friend who's, uh, we don't talk often, but we, we love each other. He came to an event I ran and he said, you know, the rabbi asked me and I couldn't say no, but he's a beautiful man, a guy named Krishnadas, who's a beautiful chanter, right? Um, and, you know, they would tell me always Nim Karoli Baba stories, who was their teacher. You know, Nim mm -hmm. Karoli Baba, and they're telling, you know, is this crazy wisdom master who has this kind of conventional life, actually, he had a very conventional life, then he had a crazy wisdom master life and he kind of moved between them and it was really about about his presence that was exactly not Shabtai. Shabtai actually had something to say he was actually a serious Kabbalist himself right obviously he had a serious presence and there's a strong tradition in Hasidism that the Baal Shem Tov the master of the good name was the founder of the Hasidic tradition Right, Buber writes a very important book on the Baal Shem Tov's tales, but there's an enormous scholarship in the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov in my lineage is one of my direct masters. The Baal Shem Tov right, talks about in private letters about how he's going to liberate the holy spark of the soul of Shabtai Tzvi. So while the, while the mainstream narrative is demonizing him, the Baal Shem Tov is saying, no, 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 he actually, he actually understood something. There's something, something's happening here. And if you trace it carefully, as I've begun to kind of find my way to Shabtai, and Shabtai's kind of found his way to me in dreams and in, in, in all sorts of right, engagements, right, you begin to realize that Shabtai understood a couple of things. So first, let me just, just, just give you the first just snippet. The first person to call women to the Torah 
Yes, so, right. Shabtai, right? right? In other words, so Shabtai is a proto-feminist. So Next. women cannot read the Torah, right? And and then and Shabtai's feed said that women could could read the Torah. The service in public is that is that the in the Orthodox service women were not at that time called to read right or to receive or to recite the benediction in the public service over the Torah. Shabtai breaks that, but yeah. of course he breaks much deeper, right? Prohibition, right? Around sexuality. I would say something like, I would like to cut everything. Shabtai basically in some very powerful way is that in my language, reality is Eros at its very core. That, that actually he takes the Kabbalistic teachings seriously, but not only as archetypal teachings, he actually understands that reality is fuck, reality is Eros. That's its very nature. And that we participate in that field of Eros. Now that might sound a lot like cosmorotic humanism to you because it is. Now Shabdi doesn't formulate any of these things in, in this kind of clear language, what he's basically saying is, right, that actually the sexual is the currency of Eros. And that actually God goddess is Eros. Or God goddess is fuck, right? But by fuck, I don't mean it in its degraded form. I mean, right, you know, the word in Hebrew is zivug. But zivug means, right, coupling. Mm. This kind of constant coupling that's happening in cosmos that actually lives in me. And that to actually bypass that force, to ignore that force, right, to actually sideline that force, actually corrupts the soul, right, in some fundamental way. Mm -hmm. That when you don't participate in the living eros, yeah. and, and essentially he's adopting a tantric position, which is yeah. the principle of non-rejection. This mm -hmm. utter principle of non-rejection, and that you have to actually participate directly in the divine reality of Eros, right? That is the very structure of reality. And that, that, and just go with me one more step, my friend, and that that Eros that lives in you, when you're alive with that Eros, you have access to the unmediated will of the divine, right? In other, in other words, you're, it's no longer mediated only via the precedent of Talm Talmudic texts. It's not even only mediated via the prism of the old revelation at Sinai, right, which is codified in the five books of Moses and uh, the prophetic and the and in the writings and the canon. No, you actually have direct unmediated access. You become the high priest who's entered the Holy of Holies and you are in Zivug, you're in Fak, right? You're, you're in the field of Eros and the field of Eros is the field of value and it gives you direct access, right, to the divine will. Now, okay. that, that's- so I think I'm understanding why what your relationship with him is now a little bit. I mean, right? after reading both your, your books, I, I guess this, this is pri prior to the law, right, in a sense, that it's, it's, it's more important Not, than the codified law. In fact, it is the law it, it's, on, that, a, on a deeper level. Am it's I not, making sense here? So that's great. That's great, brother. It's not pre-nomian. It's not before the law. Nomian nomos. It's uh -huh. not pre-nomian. And it's also not antinomian, right? Shabtai is always called these antinomian, these antinomos. No. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, the, the, the scholarship on Shabtai doesn't speak anything that we speak here as clearly as we're doing it, because the scholarship on Shabtai is kind of gets lost in its own internal conversations. The best scholar writing on Shabtai is Yehuda Libus, right? Um, and I actually just wrote him, I mean, asked him, you know, we just had an exchange um, not that long ago, a year and a half ago, two years ago. And and I said to him, I'm looking for sources for this notion of outrageous love that's kind of moved through my body over the last decade. And I've talked a lot about this, this that the structure of reality is outrageous love or evolutionary love, which is a, a later term. I wrote an essay with Ken, with Ken Wilbur on evolutionary love. But the earlier term that kind of came down in my body was outrageous love. But as the, the quality of reality itself, which is outrageous love is Eros. And Yehuda actually sent me back some sources in, in Shabtai, right? Where Shabtai actually has a phrase, and I haven't shared this publicly at all ever, has a phrase, Ahava Rabbah. Ahava is love and Rabbah is, is great, 
but Rabba's kind of outrageous, right? And, and he, he sent me a, a very, very interesting essay about how these, this term Avaraba operates, right, in Shabtai's world. And of course, that was one of the cases where I was completely shocked, right? Because I had, I, I had had this moment actually at Sally Kempton's home where I was completely just felt completely just devastated and I couldn't quite teach and I kind of went silent. And it was one of those moments where the, the beautiful, gorgeous people who were gathered, some of them are on this call, thought, oh, wow, Mark's going silent. This is very profound, but it wasn't profound at all. I had nothing to say, right? And I was just had this, this black sense of just the injustice of the world. And I, I couldn't. And, and then just this voice, just something happened. And I just say the sentence, Andrew, I promise you this is exactly how it happened. The sentence comes out of my mouth, which is we live in a world of outrageous pain. The only response is outrageous love. And then this Dharma talk that I don't remember for two hours kind of emerges. And Sally kind of took notes on and gave me the notes afterwards. And that became kind of one of the core structures of the Dharma. And it turns out that outrageous love, Avaraba, is a key structure in Shabdai's thought. Right, so that's just one. It's just a moment, right? And you know, so oh, I write yeah. Yehuda. That's amazing. Oh. Yeah, it's amazing, right? So it's a so it's the it's that sense of, and I think Kabbalah scholarship today misses it. Sholem is he's reaching for it, but the book is very unclear, isn't it? You read yeah, it. I'm I'm frustrated with the book. I because it's so psychoanalytic in a way. I mean, the, she he describes him as bipolar, and that's such a reduction. Right. of of the whole the whole business right of of i guess the whole waking up business or whatever it is that's going on there there's something there's no, something that can't be reduced to psychoanalytic you know right. modern and psychoanalytic theory in, in my um, view um Sholem is not he both takes shabtai seriously and he doesn't you uh, know exactly yeah art green and like arthur green um who's a um Contemporary is a good man. He's a contemporary of of Yudha Libas's. He's about 80, 81. And Art wrote a book on Nachman of Breslov, right? Who is, you know, one of Kafka's great. Rabbi Nachman, yeah. And Art basically spends most of the book essentially psychoanalyzing, you know, Nachman. And so Art and I met in Jerusalem and I said, like, what did you do? Right? Like, you just, you reduced Nachman to psychoanalysis. And he said, yeah, but I took him seriously in the appendix which he actually did. In the appendix, he actually took terminology of his religious experience seriously. And so Sholem is both fascinated by Shabtai and yet unwilling to actually engage with it with a kind of understanding, what is this, what is he doing? And he's not pre and he's not anti -nomic. What he's actually saying is that I become nomos. I become the law, but I become the law when I am fuck when I am Eros. Now, I am fucked doesn't mean that I'm fucking anyone. I could be completely celibate, and I could be having lots of sex and having nothing to do with I am fucked. So I want to make that very clear. Right? This is all about, all about the sensual erotic, right? which can express itself sexually or can express itself creatively, creatively or poetically or in, in radical kindness. Right? It's, it's about something much deeper, right? There's 12 billion years of Eros before there's any sex. So, so what Shabtai now, Shabtai focuses on the sexual dimension. That's his way in, and not just Shabtai. For most people, their way into the first fragrance of this field of Eros is through the sexual, which is why the sexual is so critical for people. And one of the things that we need to do is realize that the sexual models the erotic. It doesn't exhaust the erotic, right? That it's actually about fucking open reality in every dimension of life and not exiling the erotic into the sexual. And in some sense, I mean... I, I'm not, I shouldn't say this, so I, I'm not going to say what I'm about to say, but in some sense, my interior self-experience is that something of Shabtai's soul spark, right, entered me, and that's how we understand reincarnation, and that I'm trying to complete his work, right? And it's that actually he, he seeded the world with certain key ideas, but they were, yeah. they were complete, and they were somewhat bipolar, so almost not all wrong. And we need to actually liberate those sparks and actually articulate this in a way where we can actually generate right a grounded culture of arrows. I didn't it's funny, uh, like I, I heard somebody say that that he was there to liberate Jesus. I think people believe that that the you know that it was he was like the next step from from Jesus. There are people who kind of believe this uh, Sabbateans or uh, uh, 
that there's there's a way in which though so we have Jesus then you have Shabtai Sfi and in a sense this is a kind of a progression that's why. <laughs> I don't that's know if that's true or not but 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 I've heard that idea because both Jesus and Shabtai and it's an inaccurate tr tracing but there's a reason for it and there's there's a root truth and a, and a distortion yeah Shabtai reject the law and both Jesus and Shabtai say essentially, I am the light, I am the law, right? I am Eros. And let's let's take Jesus through the Mary Magdalene prism, right? Jesus and Mary are Shabtai and Sarah. Yeah. So Sarah is a courtesan who has a dream that she's going to marry the Messiah. And she goes and finds Shabtai, right? The great masters around him want to push Sarah away. He's allured to her, right? They spend, they don't stay together. But they're they're together for a period of time, and I am convinced for a lot of reasons I won't go into right now in terms of scholarship. And I'm convinced that it was actually Sarah, the courtesan, who transmitted to Shabtai directly, right, this experience of the irreducible sacredness of Eros and of the field of Eros, you know. And and that oh, that's all, interesting. Hmm. You know, and so Sarah becomes. You know, I, you know, there's a, there's a scene, and Sarah's the goddess. She yeah. she the in the 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 much talked about and little understood movie Oppenheimer. You know, that's uh you know making its way in the world. And I don't want to go down that route, but I want to just throw at you one scene that all of the reviewers, of course, missed. There's a woman named Jean Tatlock, who was a woman that Oppenheimer had a famous affair with. She's the daughter of a a Stanford you know professor, and She's this very, very, she's a communist, like any self-respecting, you know, moral person was, you know, at that moment in the, you know, in, in the development of America. It's the mid-30s, later 30s. And he meets her and she arouses him to, to activism. She arouses his, his kind of an hotel mm. room. It's already, you know, he's, it's just before the Manhattan Project. He's, or he's just beginning the Manhattan Project. And he's reading, and he's reading, you know, the Upanishads, I am death you know, I am the destroyer of worlds and she's, you know, naked. And she says to him and they're, they're in this scene and she says, read this. And mm -hmm. he, and he starts explaining it to her. She says, no, read this. Right. And she walks, you know, over to him, straddles him, brings him inside of her as he's reading and the scene ends. So mm -hmm. the, the scene was, she's the goddess. Yeah. He's, he's, he's male phallic line energy potentially redemptive, but also wildly destructive. In fact, the bomb is dropped after Germany has been defeated, right? Whether the bomb needed to be dropped or not is a far from a simple question. And she's the goddess. And mm. she's the line needs to enter the goddess and that line needs to be transformed. And, and then there's a certain moment where he says, he had promised her, he always brings her flowers because you bring flowers to the altar of the goddess, but she's the goddess figure. At a certain point he Paul, I can't come anymore. And she commits suicide. And she commits suicide, right? That's the, I mean, Jean Tatlock actually committed suicide at, at age 29. So, so mm. Sarah is, is she, Sarah's the goddess. There, there's another book. And then I pass it back to you, Andrew. There's another book. If I can recommend to people, it's this unknown book called Mary's Mosaic, which Sal and I read together. And it's about a, a particular woman that was very close to JFK. And, you know, John F. Kennedy was known for his, his womanizing. And I don't know what the word womanizing mean, but I guess it's making woman a verb, however, however that word works, right? But, you know, and and much of it or most of it was superficial, but there were a couple of women around him who actually shifted him, were actually profound women. And one of them was this woman, Mary, right? And the book is written by, I think, uh, you know, a nephew, a close friend of her son. And she describes, he describes her effect on JFK, right? And how actually, and she, so these are goddess women. Right? This is a certain quality, right? This is mm. Radha, right? Right, and that's, it's not just that Krishna dances with the milkmaidens, but Radha dances with Krishna, right? And 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 these are these are women who are, so she teaches Shaptai, right? She transmits to Shaptai this realization. Oh, that's amazing. Goddess fuck, right? That reality yeah. of Eros, and that Eros is, there's no split between the erotic and the holy. And all of a sudden, the architonics of Kabbalah, 
which all understood this, but made it this meta theoretical symbology. Hmm. See, you know, it, it actually becomes incarnate. Now, Shalom, you know, Philip Roth says in, it points out in his memoir, you know, he talks about how he was friends with the um, person who was supplying pornography to the British mandate, right? While Shalom was writing in Palestine, and the British mandate was in Palestine in pre war, <laughs> right? And Roth points out that, of course, Shalom was the major buyer. Right now, you know, in other words, you know, Sholem will, of course, say he was doing research. But the point is, Sholem is fascinated. There's a perversion, a perverse attraction, but not a full, you know, embrace of... of, of no, I wouldn't say perversion. There's a, there's a perverse, perverse, the second word, you switched it, I agree. There's a kind of, Sholem doesn't know what to do with this, right? Sholem doesn't know what to do with this. And here's the thing, here's the thing. Every failure of ethics comes from a prior breakdown of Eros. Always, it's never not true, right? Yeah. There's always, right? The source of all evil is always, right? A, a, a fundamental breakdown in our experience of the self-evident goodness of Eros, right? In which, which our lives are self-evidently meaningful, valuable, alive, awake. Right? We have this experience of radical aliveness. We're moving towards deeper contact and greater wholeness, which is the Eros equation. When I don't have that experience, but th th then there's this emptiness that I can't bear, and I have to cover the emptiness with pseudo-Eros, and pseudo-Eros is every form of evil. When we split off Eros, you bypass fuck, you create abuse. Maybe I, I before we go into like maybe evil, or because or, that's Please. pretty germane, I want to go back a little bit to the idea of Sarah being Please. transmitting something. Uh, you know, I, I was just hearing a story from somebody who was who a very kind of pure Advaitic uh, practitioner, very pure for many years. And then he had the vision of the goddess and his entire perspective changed. The whole thing became less about purity and more about a fuck, you could say, <laughs> you know, and I, and I think that's what that's and that that is going to be uh, provocative and scary to people who are, you know, but stay close, stay close, brother. So stay close. So we're in conversation. Beautiful. She said his whole thing became less about purity, more about fuck. But the whole thing is, is the purity of fuck. Yeah. And this is the thing. This, I guess the two coming together is the point, this right? The whole thing. There is no more pure experience in this world than the utter purity of fuck. That's the thing. And until I've experienced the purity of fuck, I mean, the utter, the utter crystalline purity in which you actually experience the self-evident goodness of reality, you're in radical devotion. Because what is fuck? It's radical devotion. It's this ultimate desire, it's this divine desire to pleasure the beloved, right? To, to be paying full attention, because what is, what is fuck? It's the placing of attention. That's what, that's what creation is. It's the divine placing of attention and the ultimate divine purity, which, which, which desires only one desire, which is the ultimate pleasuring of the beloved. And, and we lose that. And, you know, we mock men who want to be great lovers. Ah, oh, these men, they just want to be studs. Well, yeah, of course, there's, of course, there's reduced and degraded egoic versions of it. But actually, it's this desire to please. It's the desire to be in devotion. It's the desire to be in service, right? If you actually imagine an image, yab yum, or, or you image, right, the lover in mad devotion to her beloved, whether it's her and her, or him and him, or him and her, or her and him, or any of the gender fluid possibilities. But we're when we're loving each other madly, then we become the we become the cosmoerotic universe in person. That's that's what we are, and that's that's what the new story is. The new story is: I know I am the cosmoerotic universe in person, and the purity of that, right, vastly exceeds exponentially the purity of any other human experience we can have. Mm -hmm. Well, I was speaking of purity that has a shadow as well. Oh, I understand. And so when, when the fuck comes in, then the shadow dissolves or something like that. That's right. Well, well no, no. When the purity comes in, right? When you experience the, the another way to say it, brother, is, is the goodness of fuck, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, we have a fundamental experience of being shamed. But shamed, 
by our very aliveness. We don't have a, mm. a story of our aliveness. Our aliveness is a problem. And, and Shabtai understands, I need to reclaim the dignity of my aliveness, and I need to be able to trust my body. Because the second I'm persuaded that I can't trust my body, we have the beginning of oppression and totalitarianism, right? And if you persuade me that I can't trust my body, now that doesn't mean, I'm going to be really clear, just, just for those of us who haven't been together before, that doesn't mean I trust my surface desires. And then this is where Shabtai got a little confused. What Luria actually understood that you, is that the process of human engagement with reality is what, what Liner, and I talk about this in Radical Kabbalah, calls Berur Chuka. Right? And it took me a decade to translate it, but it's like the clarification of desire. Mm. What do I, what is my, and I shared this with Barbara Marks Hubbard in the last five years, Barbara and I talked about this a lot. What is my deepest heart's desire? My deepest heart's desire is the divine will. Right? In other words, in other words, if I can ask, if I can clarify my desire, my deepest heart's desire, now that's not simple. To access my deepest heart's desire is not simple. I've got to clarify egoic drives, right? I've got to actually do the work of transformation and transfiguration. Ken so and I the entire spiritual path, spiritual path is, is this process of clarification. Yes, sir. Holy man, brother Andrew. Yes. The entire spiritual path at mm -hmm. its core is the clarification of desire. And honestly, I don't trust any other path. I just don't, right? Because desires are always there. And anyone who claims to have split off their desires is a fucking liar, right? And using fucking in an aggressive way, in this case, not in the holy way. They're lying. They're just lying, right? Just not true, right? I don't care if you've had nirvikalpa samadhi, right? 10 times, right? After you go out of nirvikalpa samadhi, you come back and your entire egoic structure is still there. And if you go, by the way, to India, right? Go, you want to hear all the rumors swirling around India about what happened with Ramana, Ramana Maharshi in the cave are not simple, right? But let's just say that that the purified the purified self is much more complex, and all the egoic structures are still there. So if you don't engage in the clarification of desire, you are deceiving yourself and deceiving the world, right? We live we and it's, and because desire is not desire is who we are. We are desire. I am desire. I am. I am, and, and by the way, if you want to val, I, I've, I've done this work deeply in the interior sciences and deeply in practice, but if you want to move to kind of a more formal kind of left brain, so go to Martin Seligman, the dude who did positive psychology, who kind of got tired of it, gathered three other people, I got $5 million from the Templeton Foundation, published a book that no one read, but it was quite good in 2015 called Homo Prospectus. And the entire point of this book is learning cognition theory the entire point of this book, and Martin didn't write much of it, the other three people were actually brilliant. And I read every word and every footnote. It was beautifully done. Thank, I mean, I want to give them a big compliment. Essentially what that book says is, homo prospectus, meaning I'm a prospector, right? The nature of a human being is, I want the future. It means I desire the future. The essential nature of a human being is, I am a human being that desires something that I don't have now. And that is not a flaw. That's not a bug. Right, that's my essential nature, and it's the essential nature of the divine. Divinity generates reality because there's a stirring of desire in the infinite, which desires something to happen that hasn't happened yet. That's how the unmanifest becomes manifest. It's the very structure of reality itself. Reality is need and desire, and if I can't clarify my desire and need, I am engaged in self-deception. And, and when I'm in the depth of my desire, I clarify desire, and so in that sense. The sexual models eros, right? In other words, the sexual is, can I clarify my desire? And in sexuality, Andrew, parenth well, you know, let's stop here. Back to you. I'm talking too long. Stop here. Let's let's hold that. Let's just get that, get those ideas on the table because those we'll go deeper into that, but it's it's huge. It's it yeah. changes everything. Well, I mean, I, I a few things are were passing through my mind as as I was hearing you talk. I was thinking about the alchemical process. And I was thinking about how, you know, in, in alchemy, the, the fire blazes up and then the then the mercury drips down. And so it's 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 a it's a mixture of this heat and, and coolness. So so um, so so those two things uh, are enacted. 
Um, and that might be the clarification of desire. That, that's one thing I was thinking. The other thing I was thinking about is how, and that that is also the masculine and the feminine, right? The, um, the other thing I was thinking about is just how, let's say this saintly character who escapes from his desires, how that is that is a sort of, uh, that 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 is a sort of evil in a, in a way, and the other evil is the is the Caligula who who just who just kills and fucks right, who just is completely right. has unclarified desire, right? Who, who who basically lives in the throw of unclarified desire, and unclarified desire right is the root of all evil. Just yeah. clarified desire is the root of all good and the root of that all. Yeah, and the last thing they would in the Buddhist tradition they call it the hot hells and cold hells, and the whole the, the the cold hells are the hells of abstraction, where you're completely lost in abstraction and out of touch with your body, and the hot hells are are, are that you're just um, you know, a butcher of some kind. And, and right, right. No, I mean, yeah, no, that that's that's absolutely true and beautiful. And he, here's the wild thing: and to be a human being is to access my unique script of desire. And actually, every human being has a unique script of desire. That, that's my letter on the cosmic scroll, if you will, my unique self, right, is, is my outrageous love letter back to reality. And my outrageous love letter back to reality is written in the dripping ink, right, and the throbbing pulse, right, of my unique script of desire. Now, here's the paradox, and here, or here's the, the tragedy. We need to move from the tragic to the post-tragic in the language of cosmorotic humanism. 99.9% .9 of people including those people most actively involved in what they feel is kind of positive and, you know, quote unquote, good sexuality are not actually in their own scripts of desire, which is why the aftertaste is almost always bleak and depressing and, and even shattering. Because my script of desire is my unique script of desire. It's not what culture tells me. Let's take sexuality. It's not how culture tells me sexuality is supposed to look. It's not the images that the pornographic universe, right, has through machine intelligence downloaded right into my feed, right, which has basically hijacked my own script of desire. I actually have to access my own script of desire. And here's the funny thing. I don't think that a human being today, literally a human being, man or woman, women are much, much more involved, by the way, in the pornographic universe than they ever were. The statistics are completely changing. It's no longer a male universe. But I don't think a human being, let's talk about, let's say men for a second. I don't think men have any chance at not being dominated by the pornographic universe. They have no chance, zero, none, right? You cannot live in a world in which two clicks away are any possible image you could possibly want. And then you have a credit card, a little plastic thing, unless, unless, unless you've actually accessed your own unique script of desire. The only thing that's infinitely more powerful. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. The only thing infinitely more powerful than the, the superficialities of the pseudo eros of the pornographic universe, the only thing that actually right blows it away is actually your unique script of desire. My unique script of desire, right? When I can clarify Right? And let's just talk not about the broad range of desire, but about sexual desire. What kind of sex do I actually want to be having? What does it feel like? What does it look like? Right? How, how do I actually want to be touched or not touched? How do I actually want to touch? What, what's the, the, the motion and, and how does it make me feel? And, and what's the sequencing and, and how long and, and, and how long do I want to stay in the feeling? And, and, how, how, and how do I want to be held? And when do I want to be rough? And when do I want to be soft? People have no idea, none. They've got no clue, right? They live in utter ignorance and literally, right? People who manage to have orgasms essentially repeat the same orgasm again and again. But actually mm -hmm. orgasm is original. You're supposed to have original orgasms, right? They're actually supposed to be unlike any other, right? Orgasms are supposed to be unique selves and every sexual encounter is, 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 is a unique entry into my unique script of desire. But people, Andrew, have no idea what their unique script of desires. They don't even know that they have one. But I, I guess the, the the thing is, how do you have a unique script when you're being fed all these scripts, you know, oh, on your on your feed, you know, constantly? Come to the second form of existential risk, which is not the death of humanity. This is what we call it in cosmorotic humanism, Zach and I. But it's the death of our humanity. Yeah. So, 
Specifically, the pornographic universe, which is the rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, unbridled world, right, which actually says, well, we have we have absolute liberty, so we have absolute liberty to produce whatever we want, so we're going to produce high-speed internet porn. And by the way, I've become an anti-porn crusader. I want to be clear about that. You would think, oh, Gaffney must be very liberal. No, porn is fucked up. It's destroying a generation of children who are 11 years old, and they have access to high-speed internet porn, right? And it, it literally fries their minds. It destroys their ability to access arousal. It interrupts the intergenerational feed of transmission. And so the kind of pro-pornography kind of mid-70s thing, that's over. We know way too much about the pornographic universe, massively destructive of Eros, and I am kind of right deeply connected to Shabtai, and I proclaim myself an anti dater right? In other words, it's, just, it's got no place. It destroys my ability to access my unique script of desire. And I'm not anti-porn. Or somebody else's unique uh, script. Or someone else's yeah. to access. And again, I'm not an anti-porn mm -hmm. crusader based on kind of the old moral grounds. We shouldn't see nakedness, so there shouldn't be public erotica. You know, actually the cherubs above the ark who were sexually intertwisted were public erotica. No, but yeah. we've taken public erotica, right, from the temple, and we've actually downloaded it into the very, the very, the very source code of culture, and we're literally destroying a generation. And if you study, I mean, I've tracked this with Christina as we're working on the phenomenology of Eros. There's actually cross-cultural research in both open and closed societies that if people are having less and less and less sex because the self-evident value of a rapturous sexual act is no longer accessible to people because they haven't experienced it because it's unique. It's your unique script. Well, desire. well, well Mark, why do you think that there was an earthquake at a Taylor Swift concert? I mean, I, I don't mean to change the subject, uh, uh, but but what I was thinking as you were speaking is that this, the sort of Taylor Swift phenomenon, and uh, Taylor's fine, but is 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 that it, it's a cliche uh, of of and it's it's not even very sexual although it seems to be sexual it, it's kind of androgynous and it's like the Barbie thing it's like everybody it's like the people are becoming this the people all the people are becoming porn <laughs> beings or or something like no I I don't know Taylor actually a friend of mine um, I, I got nothing against Taylor I'm not I'm not putting down Taylor but who shall remain nameless. Right, him and Taylor are friends, and I, I think they'd actually be a good match. But that's a different conversation, right? Um, and you know, so I think Taylor needs to do a little more, you know, a little deeper dive into kind of text and kind of the field of eros. But, but, but Taylor is clearly, and I, I actually don't know her songs. I know that everyone in the world does, except for me. But, 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 but what I, I, I think is that, you know, if I can access in myself directly, and, and what I mean, what is what is a rock concert, right? In a rock concert, we actually have this experience for a moment of someone on the stage, right, who's having this direct experience of Eros, right, moving through them. And, and when we access, whether we're watching Michael Jordan play, right, or Taylor Swift sing, we're actually witnessing, right, a, a priest or priestess of Eros, and we're trying to access, right, the experience of Eros, through somehow participating in their experience. Yeah, like a, like a temple of Aphrodite or, or something. But temple something like of Aphrodite, and there's validity to that. Mm -hmm. but, but it I, seems like a pseudo arrows to me. But in the end, that's right. In the end, in the end, I've got to be Aphrodite myself, right? In other words, I've got to have a direct experience of being Aphrodite. And if I don't, here's the thing. Here's the thing, and I just, you know, and you know, and I was actually gonna suggest that maybe we do a, we close a little a little early tonight because I'm I'm exhausted, um, which is probably why I'm saying all these things I shouldn't be saying, right? But um, if I don't have a direct experience as a woman of being Aphrodite, and if I don't have a direct experience as a man, you know, of of being a god, right? Of actually experiencing my orgasms as prayers and as experiencing right my body right as right the field of the divine. Then I'm actually alienated from reality itself. I'm I'm out of the ground of Eros. And I wanna, if I can, Andrew, just I'm gonna add one sentence. There's a new word that I wrote um three months ago. And 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 Zach and I were just voxing a little bit ago, and we just put it into 
this first values and first principles book that we were working on at the seminar. And the new word that came down was eros value. I just want to share it with you just with your philosopher's mind. And it's, I, I used to say that eros is value and value is eros. And then I realized that I, I wasn't going far enough. It's actually inaccurate. They're one word. There's no split, right, ontologically between the word eros and the word value, right? Eros is not a value. It's, it's eros value. And it's reality is eros value all the way up and all the way down. And, and eros value means that the value of cosmos is, right, the movement of reality towards deeper contact and larger holes. That's what reality is. And in that sense, eros is ethics. There's no split because what is ethics? It's how do you create larger holes where the parts are in right relationship to each other? We're doing deep philosophy now, deep mm -hmm. structural philosophy. I sat with my friend, Derek, who's a kind of a, we, we've hired him to be a critic. He's a or to be a critic of the phenomenology of Eros that we're writing and kind of to critique it philosophy, philosophically. And I was sharing with them and he kind of kind of got it and he looked, okay, I got it now, right? Is that, you know, Eros is ethic, no split, right? Eros is the experience of radical aliveness moving towards ever deeper contact and ever larger wholeness. So that experience, deep, the nature of our contact with each other and the nature of creating wholeness, meaning separate parts to become larger wholes, that is ethos. Right, eros is value, and value is eros. Reality is eros value all the way up and all the way down. And any any denial of that, which is a denial of desire, it's actually it's actually a failure to acknowledge the empirical reality, which is reality is desire. That is what it is. And, and if we what? don't, we can't acknowledge that. We can't actually create an ethical world. We can't create a good world. What about Heartbreak. Like if we're back to Shabtai's feet and back. his tragic life, I mean, the fact that there's a sense, I don't know if you would say he would have a tragic life, but but the sense that the Messiah gets gets crucified, <laughs> so to speak. Um, uh, what about, I was thinking about that when you are saying this. So you have this positive, we have this positive notion, you know, okay. of Eros. Maybe, uh, Shabtai, here's, the, here's the question. So what Shabtai what, that moment in time was absolutely tragic and it dated is so I, there's no part of me that's going to justify that there's no part of me that's going to not acknowledge right the devastation and also i just want to also acknowledge he was extremely extreme in his practices in a way that I, i'm obviously not in other words in his circle right in other words you know you know brothers and sisters would sleep with each other and others it was like we're going to defy all boundaries it was yeah. going to be, and so it was went to a, a very radical extreme, which we psychologically know today can be damaging in ways that they didn't understand in the 16th century, right? Obviously. So I want to first be very clear that I'm not in any sense, shape, or form, neither myself or Gershon Shalom or, or Yehuda Levis, right? I'm not in any way justifying the particular practices of Shabtai. That's that clear. Having said that, having said that, you know, in some sense, Let's just think about this for a second tenderly together. Shabtai, in so many ways, if we can kind of take him out of the 16th century, Shabtai enters into Islam. And my intuition is that Shabtai was actually understanding something that they didn't understand in the 16th century. He actually understood mm. there's holiness in Islam also. Ah. Actually, I can actually go into Islam, and actually, that's not a betrayal in the way everyone thinks it's a betrayal. Not wild. Right, right, right. Well, actually, I, 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 I've I, heard that there are neo sabbateans going that convert in, to all kinds of different religions. Liberating uh, uh, spark, To liberate the sparks of holiness from each religion, yeah. Realizing a proto-universalism yeah. that the community had no way of understanding. So the only way they could understand what he did was as this ultimate act of apostasy, when actually... He's actually this first ecumenical figure that actually realizes that actually she lives everywhere. And, and she's a Sufi and she's, she's, she's a, you know, and she's a, you know, a Vajrayana Buddhist, right? And she's a Kashmir Shaivite. And he actually understood that he could actually enter into the depths and liberate the sparks. And, and so that's understood from the perspective of the Jewish sources as an apologetic, you know, made by the Sabatians to explain his betrayal. But I actually don't think that was his experience. 
I think his experience was, was that he actually understood something that was not available, just like he understood something about Eros. And he understood something about the emergence of the feminine, right? You know, he understood something that wasn't available, right? And which is why I think that actually in an, a very serious number of extremely serious masters remained in a hidden fashion, loyal to the integrity of his messianic character, even after the apostasy. Mm -hmm. Shalom doesn't know what to do with that. The other thing, the other insight that I, I've heard was Please. that this messianic principle, uh, it's not, it doesn't belong to one person. It passes from person to person. It would be wrong to say that it's Jesus is the Messiah. In other words, it's not Jesus of Nazareth. The, the, the wine skin is not the wine or, or something like that. That no, this that's Messianic good. principle is something that moves through history. No, that's, that's good, brother. In other words, I mean, I would say if you would ask, if you would put a 357 magnet in head and ask, uh, there, please explain to us. I did the, uh, uh, Sorry, I lost you there for a sec. Your voice cut out. But if you would press me hard and say, okay, why do the Jews reject Jesus? as the historic Messiah, actually for two reasons. One is that Jesus rejected history. So basically, when, not Jesus himself, but when Jesus right, is crucified, his students basically say that redemption is purely internal and requires no expression in the external world, right? So in other words, redemption becomes ahistorical, right, in Christianity, well, in Hebraic sources, it's both ahistorical and historical, but the historical dimension is central. So that's one. But second is, and, and I would say if you want to, wanted to read something about this, right, my academic advisor at Oxford was Moshe Edel, and Moshe, and, and I, I, Moshe is a, a great man, and, you know, some of his writing is not as clear as it should be, but his thinking is, is extremely clear. And he, he wrote a book called Messianic Mystics, and in Messianic Mystics, there's a very, very good academic chapter about this notion that you just articulated. And he, uh, just to cite one text you know, from Nahum of Chernobyl, this associate of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement that we adduced earlier, he says that every human being participates in what he calls Komat Mashiach, participates in the stature or the body of the Messiah, that every human being is literally part of the messianic being or body, the body of the Messiah, right? And, and that's one of the places that I've derived the notion of what I call unique self-symphony, right? That we're actually, that, that Messiah is actually a unique self-symphony in which every person is playing their own irreducibly unique instrument and that music comes together and that music is the music of Messiah, but, but all it's Messiah means, and now let's go back to your original question, which is what is Messiah? So really what Messiah means, and this is again missed in, in Hebrew scholarship, it just because Hebrew scholarship and general scholarship on, on Messianism gets lost in its own win-lose metrics, kind of writing its own articles within its own departments. But if you really want to get what Messiah is, like cut through all of the literature, which is so obfuscating and confusing, and, and I've read you know too much of it. I have to atone for how much of it I've read, right? But But Messiah means something very, very simple, brother. Just like there's a first big bang, which is the explosion of matter, right? Right. No thing becomes something, what matter. And then matter triumphs as life. The second big bang, the biosphere. And then we go through all the levels of life. And then life triumphs. The third big bang is the self-reflective human mind, right? So then the self-reflective human mind develops through all of its levels. And then it triumphs as a possibility of a new human and new humanity. That's Messiah. Messiah means actually in most of the sources, a new stature, a new possibility for what it means to be a human being. That's gorgeous. And when wow. you actually that. So that's like the Nietzschean overman. I mean, I'm saying that. I, yes. It's I was talking to some Nietzscheans the other day, and 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 I, I have a theory that Nietzsche was a Christian, even though he hated Christianity so much because all of his ideas seemed to be about, you know, uh, no, 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 the, no, the no. Messiah, the overman. <laughs> but anyway. No, no, but as usual, your intuition is brilliant, right? In other words, Nietzsche is 
is completely reaching for this. I, I, I'm, I'm madly in love with at least certain parts of Nietzsche. His sister kind of did some bad stuff with his work, but Nietzsche yeah. had his understanding something. He's understanding there's a new human that needs to emerge. So yeah. Messiah is the lineage's intuition of the possibility of a new human. And when you then hijack that either to any nation, the Jews, or any person in a nation, mm -hmm. and then you basically destroy right, the essential in intuition of the messianic idea, which is what I would call in cosmorotic humanism, Zach and I call it the fourth big bang. The fourth big bang is the emergence of homo amor. Homo amor is messiah, right? Homo amor is the fulfillment of homo sapien as homo amor. I mean, it's, it's stunning. And you begin to realize, oh my God, I mean, maybe what I know, and I, and I want to, I know we're going to move towards closure, but I'll just, can I just share with you just a text that just, just occurred to me? There's this beautiful text, right, in Cook, right? You know, right, you know, Abraham Cook, who was the first chief rabbi of Palestine and one of the just most stunning, you know, mystics that, that lived. So he has this, he says, um, where is this? He says, here it is. He says, he says to ask about this is in his um in his mystical diary, which is called Arpile Tohar. They never thought would be um published. In Thirteen. It's called Mists of Purity. So he writes, he writes, and he's writing to himself. He says, to ask about the higher knowings, how do you know, has no meaning. And I'm loosely translating, has no meaning. Once we find in the center of the soul, and I'm a higher eros. It's not his word. I'm. I'm transluminating, if you will, and in a treasure of organized knowings which fit together, right? And, and he says, and all gnosis that comes from research is only a means by which to arrive at this higher knowing, right? This higher eros, which the soul spills forth from within the deepness of her depths. So the soul is spilling forth this possibility of, of homo amor, of this new human, of this new humanity. Right? And that's where we are, my friend. We're at this moment in which we have this meta crisis. Crisis is an evolutionary driver. And the only way we can possibly respond to the meta crisis is not by fixing the infrastructure, which we need to do. And my friend Daniel is doing really good work on that. And it's not by fixing you know, the social structure, which we need to do. And, and there's some really good work being done on that. And that should all be done. But unless we fix the story of value, the core story of value at the center, the actual story in which we live, from which we create, from which we generate reality, unless we generate a new story of value, right, it's going to crash. And at the core of the new story of value is the emergence of a new human and a new humanity, right, who is a desire, who is a desire, right, who, who trusts and who clarify, I clarify my deepest heart's desire. So that's the, that's the story we have to tell, but we not only have to tell the story, brother, we have to be the story. Hmm. We have to be home more and more. We have to invoke, we have to enact home on, we have to cross to the other side. Just like Abram crosses to the other side. We have to cross to the other side, All right? We've got it, we've got it, right? It's the crossing. Cha. Very good. I mean, there is more to say, but. Um... More to say, but but this is a good, this is a good start on Shabtai. This is a good start on Shabtai, my friend. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty wow. That was pretty that was incredible. Wild. Thank you. <laughs> wild. Um, oh, no, thank you. Thank you, right? It's wild. I don't even, I didn't even really know why I wanted to talk to you about Shakta or even why I read the book. I, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't something very conscious. It's just something that was pulling me in. And I think I, I know a little bit more why now. <laughs> Andrew, you are, you are a delight. You are Eros itself. And I just, I just, I have great joy in talking to you. So thank you for being Andrew Sweeney. Amen. Thanks so much. Hey, blessings, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much for squeezing all that beauty out of Mark. Mark, amazing. It was amazing tonight. I, I'm, I'm just completely uh, blown open. And I know, I, I see everybody smile in the room. What a conversation. Wow, 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 wow. Yay. Thank you. See you all. Um, yeah. First Sunday of next month and every first Sunday from now on. Um, great yeah. to be back. Gorgeous, everybody. Have a gorgeous, gorgeous night. Thank you so much. Mad, mad Thank pleasure. you all. Bye-bye. Right. Hey, with your prince. Great to see you all. Mwah. Yay, everybody. Mad love. <laughs>